Welcome back again and happy Chinese New Year, uh, the year of the snake. And so we're going to do an intro video of Fung Brothers of called Boba Life. And uh, of course, food is a huge mark of identity. So great, very relevant for our class. When I was just a small child, my mother. I remember. When I was just a small child, my mother always take us to go drink tea. And now, many generations later, even in America, you still drink tea. I think this is Hanku. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Factory Tea Bar. What kind of drinks can I get started for you today? I want a Samsung The... That's the, um... It means she wants a boba milk tea. I should probably know that. Yo, what up? You're listening to 62.6 FM, and we got a hot new track for y'all. It's called Boba Life. Tasty, 
Got me cheesing like the lolly cup daisy. Only eat bow. I don't need pastries. Wanna hang later? Call me maybe. Bubble tea, it's short till it's frothy. Since my first tea, house forgot about the coffee. You know you miss it. 626 living. Boba land the 49th assembly district. Met a boba queen, straight from Taiwan. Cook the pearl perfect, had to put it in a song. You only drink boba? You know I love it all. I also drink lights. I'm a pop from Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, hop in the car. Cup holder too small, boba's too large. You could play cards, but you should study hard. Cause this life won't be cool 10 years from now. Make it tasty, make it tasty. The new drink of all the young Asians. Make it tasty, make it tasty. You can call us the boba generation. So actually, this is a good introduction uh, for a later video, uh, later our later book, Chop Suey, and we're going to talk all about Chinese food. So it should be like really great, uh, all food, all types of Chinese food. So that will be great uh, and exciting. Okay. All right. So behind the success of Chinese Americans, well, we previously videos we talked about how 75% of all Chinese Americans have a BA, which is crazy high, right? Think of a China and China. You think of Chinese people in China, 1.3 billion people in China. The mass majority, like 99 or 90 percent, do not have a BA, and a lot, actually, a lot of majority of them actually go into like an eighth grade education. So this has something to do with the agency in America and maybe what the the immigrant know-how that they came to the United States, right? So very different, particularly if you look at let's say Indian Americans. We talked about how majority of Indian Americans do not have a BA, but Overwhelmingly, Indian Americans in America have a BA, not just a BA, but also an MA and a PhD, right? So we, again, we have a special visa for PhDs uh, for Indian Americans, in, particularly in engineering. So that's going to skew the migration, and that's going to actually skew like who comes to America and what type and how that uh, affects. All right. Behind the success, structure versus culture, okay? So is it the culture of Chinese or is it the structure, okay? All right, so Chinese schools. Zhong uh, Wen, Shou uh, Xiao. Okay, sorry, my Chinese is pretty bad. Actually, I did take Chinese at UCLA, but I, I, I got a D, okay? But the third time around, I was able to pass it, so yay, okay. All right, so Chinese schools, uh, pillars in most Chinese populations globally, yes. Uh, it is definitely a huge pillar of Chinese people around the world, uh, and definitely the diaspora, okay? Now, Chinese from, from into the U.S., mostly they came from Guangdong, the Canton province, right? So the primary people actually the, in the diaspora are from southern China. China, right, from Guangdong. So they actually speak Mandarin, right? I'm sorry, they speak Cantonese, not Mandarin. I mean, Mandarin is the Potonghua, is the common language. And actually, the diaspora, the Chinese around the world tend to speak Cantonese or other kind of uh, sub dialects, right? Now, when they first came to the US, they built what? I talked about Chu Chu Chu. What did they build? That's right, I hear it. It's a railroad, yes. So when they first came to the U.S., they actually uh, built railroads in the West Coast, uh, sugar canes in, in Hawaii. But the new, actually post-1965 Chinese, were actually a lot of them were uh, educated, um, literate, we talked about it last time. Um, and particularly the ones from Taiwan who actually had a degree, right? And that very particular and very different. Um. All right, so let's look at this exclusion area, okay? Now, in 1882, there was a Chinese Exclusion Act that ex excluded all Chinese people from coming to the United States. So it's really interesting, right? In 1848, you had all these people, you know, all this, like William Hopper saying, you know, Chinese people, come, come, help us with our, our plantation, help us with our, our trains. And so you had this, like, huge pulling in of Chinese, and all these poor, illiterate Chinese men came to build, right? But then there was, like, inter-ethnic co uh, competition, and as always, when the economy goes down, who do you scapegoat? 
Who do you scapegoat when the economy goes down? What? It's happening now? 2013? Yes, you're right. It is immigrants. It's always immigrants. If you look throughout our history, whenever the economy goes down, that's when anti-xenophobic rises, right? Currently, I have really never seen the anti-Latino sentiment as high as it is now, right? So this is 2013. This class is actually illegal in uh, Arizona. I can't even say these things in Arizona. I, uh, I have a friend who works at Arizona State, and I was like, oh, you know, you should use uh, this book, Min Zhao. Min Zhao banned, right? Uh, basically, you cannot teach Chicano studies or Asian American studies or African American studies right now in Arizona, right? So huge anti, I would say, Latino and Asian sentiment. Uh, especially if you look at Arizona's AB 1070, where they can, the police officer can stop you and ask you, you know, if you have documentation. So again, 1882, um, you could say that happened a long time ago, or you could say 2013. Similar, similar. Okay. So here during this time, 1882 um, and 1870s, and actually I'm going to have a whole chapter on what happened in 1870s because 1870s uh, we have pulling in the Chinese. And then, and then we have anti-immigrant sentiment when the economy goes down. There's like competition, right? And actually, 1870s was one of the largest lynchings of Chinese outside of China, right? So, if 18 uh, people are murdered, lynched, swinging around in Los Angeles. So, we're going to talk about that. Actually, that will have its own lecture, okay? Uh, so. In 1882, so that fomented, and we had the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, okay? So let's look at the uh, sex ratio now. In 1890s, remember these Chinese were trapped in LA, they could not leave, right? Uh, they, they were bamboozled to come to the United States, they didn't have enough money to go back to China, right? And then there's no new Chinese women coming in, so they're basically one of the worst lives ever, right? Bachelor society. And then we talked about the genocide, and we're gonna have a whole lecture on that itself. Uh, not genocide, but the massacre that happened to the Chinese uh, in LA, actually, um, 18, uh, lynchings, uh, but many more people were actually shot in the face, etc. So in 1890, there's 27 men to every one woman, right? So you can see that the, the demographic was extreme, right? So most men uh, did not have a wife, right? Most men did not um, have a mate, and so it was a very sad and bachelor life, and they live and die that way, okay? Now you see, um, after the 1906, so write down your notes, 1906, something huge happened, Write down your notes, 1906, star it, underline it, okay? So 1906 had a huge earthquake. And in the earthquake that happened in San Francisco, and what happened is it destroyed and a lot of the buildings, right? It was fired, and one of the buildings was a was a federal building that actually had the documentation for people who are citizens, right? So a lot of Chinese people use that opportunity actually to have something called paper son, paper daughter, which is they actually fabricated or said they had were married or said they had children in China, and I actually alleviated a lot of the stress in the Chinese community. And so you see that happened in 1906, so it changed the demographic a bit, right? Uh, so 19, 1910, you have 9 to 1, 9 to 1. So that uh, kind of alleviates the strain. And again, if you're a sociology major, you know whenever we have males at the age of 15 to 24, and if they're primarily with each other and unemployed, you always have higher crime, right? So you can imagine the crime rate when it was like 27 to 1, right? So it's alleviated at uh, 9 to 1 in 1910, and in 1940s, it went to 2 to 1. So Still, uh, mo most men, uh, not most men, but one and two men uh, could not find a mate, but it was much better then, okay? All right, so please uh, star this, underline this, circle this. This is the most important thing I want you to learn in the class. Um, this, all these demographics changed, right? Because obviously we have a lot of Chinese Americans, a lot of Asian Americans in class now. And it, it happened because of what? Something 1965, so star it, circle it. This is super important. I need to know, know this. Uh, the one thing I want you to know from this class is this date, which is the 1965 Heart Seller Act, right? Basically, that's an immigration act that allowed um, everyone equally to come to the United States. And basically, if you're from Cal Poly or any of the Cal states, all the fellow people around you were able to come in through the 1965 Heart Seller Act or the Immigration Act, which was pushed by African Americans, was again pushed by African Americans. African Americans are the ones who fought for equal rights, particularly immigration, and Latinos and Asians very much took advantage of that by immigrating over here, okay? Which is ironic, right? Because there's a lot now, why is that ironic? There's like kind of anti-African American sentiment in, the, in immigrant groups, right? So I want you to think about that. So please, right now, Write down 1965 Heart Seller Act 
1965 Immigration Act, which allowed equal immigration for all ethnic groups. So that is the one thing I want you to know from this whole entire class. That's the one day I want you to know. That's the date. So please know the 1965 Hard Seller Act. All right, that is basically changed and completely the United States. All right, Chinese schools. Whenever there's a visible Chinese population, there's always what? A Chinese school, right? So pretty much when there's a visible Ch a Chinese population, there's always a Chinese school. All right, changing formations, okay? So Chinese schools have really changed in time. They've really uh, acclimated and actually blended with American society. Remember, Chinese schools is... Chinese American schools or Chinese schools in America are really an American phenomenon because think about in China. Most people in China are, have gone up to eighth grade and don't have the opportunity to go to school, right? So it's usually these elite or at least student, uh, parents who really want to push this, uh, this idea of school that they really didn't get themselves in, let's say, Hong Kong or something, okay, or mainland China. So number one, so today's Chinese schools, they push their kids to do well in school to get a college and get into college and get a well-paying job, right? So just it's pretty common. It's like an immigrant sentiment, right? You still want your kids to do well, get a college, and get immigrant and like a high-paying job. Number two. Now, many Chinese parents are kind of dissatisfied uh, with American schools, and thus they want more their kids to do more. And this is actually, uh, unfortunately, America did not score well in the international uh, kind of, I think we scored like 17 or something, and that's not good because we are arguably, we, we could argue that we're the hegemonic power in the world, the greatest hegemonic power in the world. Uh, so you could argue that we should be number one, but we were not number one. Actually, Shanghai was number one. I think it was like Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, they all were like one, two, three, four, five. Just incredible high scores. Um, we did not score well. Our high school students, it was an international contest. We did not score well on math. So, um, and the other, I guess, barometers that they, um, the pit again. So a lot of Chinese parents who had kind of a more rigorous kind of academic life in China or in uh, Hong Kong or in Singapore realize that the schools, particularly our public schools, are not doing enough, right? So they'll send their kids to mental math classes, they'll send their kids to Kumon, right? So these are things that they do um, that, um, particularly if you're from California and we're cutting off more and more days of school and if you compare our days, we have like 180 days to like 250 days from Korea. Um, remember, after, in Korea, after school, you go to another school. And there's also Saturday school, right? So you go to school like six, seven days a week, but after school, you have another school, right? So uh, you really, you have to do extra, right, if you're in America. If you want that same type of rigorness, right, that, that you have in Asia for the certain type of elite class, right, you have to send your kids to do more things, okay? Also, um, we talked about the international test, Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, Korea are the top, right? So we talked about how in class, in Asia, you know, you really, a lot of students actually go to school 9 to 5. It's like a job, right? And you also have uh, Saturday school. So what you do is you get there at 8, you bow to your teacher, you get out at 2. But after at 2.30, at 3, you have like 40 minutes, you would actually go to a cram school, which would actually help you with your regular school. And that would take you to 6 p.m. or to 8 p.m. Right, and then after 8 p.m. to 12, you're like studying and doing your homework. And there's Saturday school, right? So Saturday school is additional school all day long. Sometimes uh, they'll catch you up in other ways, right? So again, this is not uncommon. This is actually common in Asia, right? Very common in Asia. So if you go to America and you see that the kids have very little homework and the math is very trivial and not uh, up to your snuff, and then no, you're going to send your kids to another school after school, right? Particularly if you know that this, this is what people do in Hong Kong, right, or uh, Taiwan, which is typical and uh, common, then you're going to do this for your own kids in America, right? So it kind of changes American life uh, for Asian Americans. All right. So a lot of Chinese schools, they're associated with uh, different, different institutions. So some are associated with churches. So they're like Christian Chinese schools. So you see a lot of these are actually from Taiwan. It's interesting. Um, and particularly if you look at someone like Jeremy Lin, right, like basketball player. Sometimes I'll show a clip of him. Um, Jeremy Lin is actually atypical for Chinese Americans because Chinese Americans in general are not Christian, right? But he is actually of Taiwanese background and many Taiwanese are Christian, right? So he's an outlier in so many ways, not just as 
Asian American or Chinese American in the NBA, but within the Chinese community, he's like very unusual because he talks about the uh, these Bible verses, etc. Okay, so the first one is associated with churches, right? Chinese schools, a lot of them, um, they, they seem to be it's within the Chinese. Uh, uh, a lot of mainland people would not go to these churches, right, or these people from Hong Kong. So it's, it tends to be kind of like a Taiwanese uh, kind of crowd. There's nonprofits, right? So a lot of Chinese schools, they are run by sometimes a staff of two people, right, or three people. And it's just for the heart of them. Um, I'm thinking about Monterey Park. I'm thinking about uh, Wang Lusher. She has a Chinese school. And literally, she just wants to promote Chinese culture. And so a lot of the parents, um, they pay little to nothing, and um, she, and she's a very a warm-hearted woman. And what she—it's not a profit. It's just she wants to help these kids learn about Chinese culture and do better in school. And she's on these kids like more than their actual regular school teachers, right? And so, so a lot of that is uh, definitely the heart and soul. You can see a lot of great teachers. All right, so that is she actually runs an everyday school in Monterey Park. Um, there's also something called Saturday schools, right? Saturday schools. I know, like now, if you're thinking, I know probably like 20 percent of people or 30 percent of people watching this video have gone to a Saturday school at one point of their life, right? So it's usually like nine to twelve or twelve to three, right? So do you want to do the SAT portion or not, right? It's really common to do Saturday school, right? Um, you learn Chinese for three hours a week, right? So again, it's some, is it positive or negative? We talked about it earlier. All right. So let's look at now the for-profit institutions, after-school programs or college preparation enrichment programs. Like after the 1980s, remember we had a new explosion of Asians coming in, particularly elite Asians from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and they, they're seeing this opening where the, the, just the, the American school system is just really truly inadequate, right? It's, it's a teaching math that is taught in first grade in China, right? So it is uh, really, really inadequate. And, uh, and particularly, I would say in math, there's like there's like a four-year difference, right? It's a very um, difference, right? So they start actually opening up their own schools to address this issue, right? And you see them: Kumon, ACI, A plus, Language First, Chinese Mental Math, Christian Taiwanese schools all over. So they open up these schools, and actually, they're not just schools in in actually here. In America, you might think, oh, it's a school. Actually, it's a chain, and actually, they're in also in Asia as well. Okay, so they're huge, and actually, in Hong Kong, the tutors are stars, and they have commercials, etc. Okay, so these for these schools, they are actually um, they're profit driven, and they have a, a usually a agenda which is to do well on say like SAT classes, right? So or AP English classes or writing. So th that is a, its niche, and pretty popular in America. All right, so there are intangible effects of Chinese school. What are the intangible effects? Well, we talked about earlier in our, our earlier slides how Asian Americans uh, feel kind of, they, be, they learn Americanization, but they also learn Chinese culture and the pride, et cetera, right? And there are costs, right? And, and, and so, so sort of like we talked about how uh, these intangible effects could be positive because if you're a minority in a, a large majority that is quite hostile towards you, that has negative media about you, and you've internalized all these negative images of Asian Americans, or Asians in particular, right? This space of Chinese school could be actually a positive thing where it can actually give you self-esteem, right? And it's something that's really positive, right? And again, Asian Americans have the highest what rate, guys? Something negative. What do Asian Americans have the highest what of? So I'll wait, one, two, three, four, five, okay? So in our first slides, we talked about Asian Americans have the highest suicide rate, right? Asian American elderly have the highest uh, suicide rate as well. Asian American women actually uh, have the highest suicide rate, and Asian American men have the highest attempted at suicide rate. So again, Asian Americans, particularly because of the model minority myth, right? The myth that all Asians do well, they're all happy, they're all rich, right? is very dismissed, right? Um, and some, some Asian Americans actually incorporate that, they internalize it, and hey, not everyone could go to Harvard, right? Majority of people don't, right? So again, uh, we Asian Americans have uh, the highest uh, suicide rate, and so there's a cost, there's a cost for, for this. There's a tangible benefit of always trying to uh, do well, do, do better, get in a good school, but also there's costs, like a lot of stress on these kids, right? So these kids go to school and they have after school, right? And um, you know, what is the cost, right? All right, so let's take a break, and we'll go to the next lecture after this one.